I'm delighted to be here. It, it warms my heart to see so many people interested in investing in health tech because that's something very near and dear to my heart. And it really warms my heart to see so many people from Houston here, you know, Houston proud. Uh, I'm going to talk about my own personal journey through medical device innovation because it's all about investing in innovative stuff. Where does that innovative stuff come from? It comes from a lot of sources. I'm going to draw from my own experience and tell you a little bit about my last 20 years and how it's brought me to this new position, this new opportunity that you just heard described. Uh, this slide, uh, this slide, oh, did you push the little thing in the laptop? The, uh, well, how about you just advance it? That's okay. Or I can just stay on this one. Uh, this is a vestige from being an academician. Everybody in here is conflicted about everything. Next slide. This is my favorite... Uh, okay. This is my favorite slide about innovation. This is a quote from Nikola Tesla, hero to anybody innovative, one of the architects of the modern world. I don't think there's any thrill that can go through the human heart like that felt by the inventors. You see some creation of the brain unfold to success. Such emotions make a man forget. Food, sleep, friends, love, everything. And I think even in investing, when you're chasing a dream and it starts to materialize, there's nothing more addicting and intoxicating. And once you do that, you want to do it over and over again. I think that's why we're all here. Now, I was very fortunate. I got to train to be a heart surgeon under this man, Michael DeBakey, one of the patron saints of medical device innovators in the world. Very famous heart surgeon. I was his last chief resident uh, and spent thousands of hours with this man, but this is my favorite photograph of him. Here he's sitting down at his wife's sewing machine, taking a piece of Dacron that he bought at the fabric store and sewing it into a tube in anticipation of replacing the aorta, the largest blood vessel in the body, and a dog, and in so doing being the father of the modern prosthetic graft. And if that doesn't strike you, boy, man, get another coffee, because that's how innovation happens. A lot of people think stuff, but one guy, one girl, one person, goes to the fabric store, gets the piece of fabric, and does the experiment. And then it's, there's no stopping it. And so that struck me, how, how that, one, that one day that he decided to do that had such a dramatic impact. 20 million of those have been implanted. So after training with him, and it takes, uh, after high school, I had to do 16 more years of school to become a heart surgeon. I went to Harvard, to the Beth Israel Deaconess. I spent the first two years just trying to get through heart surgery, uh, heart operations uh, safely and quickly. And it's daunting when you first start operating. But by about a year and a half, I was feeling more comfortable than I probably should have. And I started thinking about innovation because I was so jazzed working for all these innovative guys in Houston, Texas. And one of the operations I was doing a lot is coronary bypass. And people that disparage heart surgeon call it plumbing or laying pipe. But it's a very important operation to bypass blockages in the arteries. You can see on the right there, we've taken veins from elsewhere in the body and very carefully sewed them on to bypass blood around the blockages. And as you can imagine, those arteries on the surface of the heart are about as big around as cooked spaghetti, and they're very, very delicate. So it has to be very still while you're putting those delicate stitches in. And you've got to be able to see what you're doing. And to do that, to obtain that sort of field and that... Uh, uh, operative exposure, we put the patient on the heart-lung machine. We put tubes and hoses in. The, that big machine that man's sitting at circulates the blood, adds oxygen, takes out carbon dioxide so we can stop the heart, pack it nice, and very carefully put in these precise stitches. Well, we'd heard about some guys in South America, and now I'm two years into my practice, that were doing this operation with the heart still beating. And I thought, wow. And they thought, because some of the risk of heart surgery is actually putting them on that machine, being on that machine, getting them off of that machine. And so my chief said, you ought to go check that out. There's two guys in the United States doing it. I went and watched one at Johns Hopkins. And his assistant held a little two-pronged fork trying to mash down on the heart to hold it still while he, while he sewed. And all of us watching, there were three surgeons there, were holding our breath. It was stressful even to watch. And at the end of the operation, I said... Uh, that looks like your assistant has almost a harder job than you. Why don't they make it so the little retractor that's mashing on the heart locks into position? Because if, if the assistant mashed down too hard, the blood pressure would drop, and the anesthesiologist would say, let up, let up, let up. And if he didn't mash down hard enough, the heart would get break free, and he'd have to reposition him. I said, why, don't, why doesn't somebody make it uh, so you lock it in place? And he said, I'm sure someone's working on that. And I went, yeah, me. 
So I envisioned something that looked like, sort of like a cut up spoon. In fact, it looked exactly like a cut up spoon. So I went to the grocery store, I bought a bunch of spoons, I took them home, I cut them up, I went to the animal lab, I got the thing working, it was really funny too. I was working really hard, taking call, doing operations every day, and I'd go there in my scrubs, and one day, uh, the lady at Stop and Shop recognized me from my compulsive spoon buying and said, <laughs> What gives, Doc? And I said, oh, I'm trying to make a, a device that'll allow you to do heart surgery without stopping the heart. And she said, oh. <laughs> she must have heard that a lot. Anyway, um, this, this was a device, and I won't go into how it worked, but it was a very simple device. And here's one of my first human operations with my cut-up spoon. Industry saw it. They liked it. They bought it. They brought it to market. It ultimately was used in about a a quarter of a million operations before it was surpassed by better technology. And here, there's the blood spraying out of the artery, and as I pull down that rubber band, it pulls the artery up against the back of the little plastic platform. If I were trying to sew anywhere else on that moving surface, it'd be impossible. But in that little square window, it was motionless and blood-free, and had about as much mechanical complexity as a Happy Meal toy. And yet, I saw from my efforts, these you know, simple efforts of going to the store, and that ignited in me something that's been dominant in my career for the last 24 years. Uh, again, it became a product, it was really successful. It was so wonderful for me to see it have a life of its own. See people that I had trained teaching other people, and those people teaching other people. And I wanted to do that over and over again. And as a result of that, I've put together this brief synopsis. I call this Medical Device Innovation 101. And these are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight steps that I think if you focus on these, you can come up with really innovative stuff. And I'm going to go through each of these. Now, talking to you guys about unmet clinical needs in a field you really understand, I think everybody in here gets that. It's got to be something that helps patients. It's got to take costs out of the system. It's got to address an unmet need. That's a given. And if you're not a domain expert in a field, it's difficult to invent in that field, but you partner with somebody. And that's one of the things that I encourage engineers to partner with doctors, doctors to partner with engineers. But I always encourage people to think simplicity. When you're trying to solve something in your life, if people look at you, your friends, your partners, your peers, and say, that's too simple, that'll never work, hurry up and patent it. It's probably the next significant innovation. These are... Uh, Seven ideas that were way too simple to work, and each one of these has had a profound impact on the way we practice medicine. Balloon angioplasty. John Simpson, are you still here? John Simpson sort of introduced balloon angioplasty, the idea of putting a balloon down where a narrowing is so you didn't have to bypass it and inflate it and push the blockage back. When, when you guys were first talking about doing that, people stood in line to slap you and tell you how idiotic it was. Now it's being done over a million times a year. Balloon embolectomy, Tom Fogarty, a mutual friend, some of you guys probably know, uh, came up with the idea of using a balloon to pull clot out. He did it when he was a medical student. They did a couple cases and presented at Grand Rounds. The president of the American College of Surgeons was in the audience and stood and said, only someone as junior as a medical student would not understand why this won't work. Well, it's been used in 25 million cases, saved countless lives and legs, and was the founding product of Edwards Life Science. Percutaneous aortic valve. Who thought that was going to work? John and I were talking about that last night. The idea that you could take a valve on a stent, put it inside another narrowed valve, and just push the old valve back. All of us who'd seen diseased aortic valves said, you can't do that. The thing's like oyster shell. I mean, it's like rock. You can't just push it to the side, but they use the orthopedic surgeon's principle. Do you guys know that? If brute force doesn't seem to work, you're clearly not using enough. <laughs> and then percutaneous AV fistula. That's something I'm working on now that to a man, everybody I trusted and admired told me to give up. That it was a stupid idea. Were they right or was I? Well, stay tuned. You got to be resourceful when prototyping. How many of you have heard of MacGyver? Remember that guy, they had a show in the 80s, had the mullet haircut, and he could repurpose things uh, readily available in his environment to defeat terror or defuse nuclear warheads. If you understand who MacGyver is and what MacGyvering is, then I think you'll immediately recognize this is Medical Device Prototyping Headquarters. 
If you have an idea and you can't kind of demonstrate it by the things on the aisles and shelves of Home Depot or the toy store or now with Amazon, you can have anything in the world in your hand in two or three days. If you don't know how to get started, you're just not being creative enough because it's all there. Every material, every size, and it's, the world has never been easier to navigate than it is right now while I'm talking. You have to also be open-minded. We all have filters. We say, this is a writing implement, this is a coat hanger. Those are both so much more. This is a true story. I was innovating. It was late at night. My sheepdog and I were in my home shop. I needed a plastic tube about this long, about as big around as a toothpick. It had to permit a piece of dental floss uh, to pass through it, and it had to have column strength, meaning you could push something with it. Cocktail straw had too big of a lumen. I looked through all my stuff. I said, Home Depot. Ran into Home Depot, found the guy in the obligate orange apron and said, I need a little plastic tube. And he said, yeah, what for? And I said, that's probably not going to be helpful. And he goes, no, 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 no. So if you tell me what you're going to use it for, I can tell you where to go, like gardening or plumbing or... And I said, really? It's, it's, and he said, just, just tell me. It was almost 11 o'clock. It was summer. Home Depot was open till 11. And I said, okay, I'm trying to make a thing to tie off the left atrial appendage in patients with atrial fibrillation so they don't have to take blood thinners and I want to do it under x-ray without opening the chest. He said, no, man, we don't have anything like that. Well, it, the store was almost closing, so he's got a clipboard in one hand and hanging down by his right side, he's got a bottle of Windex and in the Windex is my tube. So not only did he have it, he had it in his hand while he was telling me they didn't have it. So opening your filters and seeing everything for what it can possibly be. And then don't get hung up about quality of prototypes. Just do it. These spoons were laughably crude. They had a significant impact. This is a device that Tom Fogarty invented, and I'm not going to go into what it is, but I will show you his prototype. Corn on the cob tongs, a piece of coat hanger wire, and a guitar string. If Tom Fogarty, one of the patron saints of innovators, is allowed to make devices like this, I think we all are. And I think, John, you're going to show some kludgy prototypes later in the day, which I can't wait to see. This is one of my favorite... <laughs> huh? <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite kludgy prototypes. I had this idea for a system for putting in valves, and I won't go into what it was, but it allowed you to use half as many needles because it was all chained together. And I presented it at a conference kind of like this, but filled with heart surgeons. And one by one, they got up to the dry erase board and told me why it wouldn't work. I didn't have any of these cool graphics. Uh, the guys who scheduled the conference said, eh, hang in there, slugger, you're not going to get them every time. And I said, no, yeah, I am. These guys don't understand. I went home. I said, I didn't do a good enough job explaining it. I went to the Hobby Lobby, <laughs> spent $25 on styrofoam, spray paint, and yarn, brought that back the next month and showed them why all their concerns weren't legit. It came to market. It's been on the market for 15 years and does great. And by the way, I took this to the FDA and stood there. I felt like a bad imitation of Jim Henson to get the 510K. One of my favorite quotes, to invent, you need a good imagination, a pile of junk. There is free junk everywhere, 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 especially medical devices. All medical devices have a shelf life. They expire after a year and a half, and someone at the hospital goes through and puts them all in a big cardboard box, and when it's full, they call the phone number. A guy in a truck comes and takes it off. They mail them back a check. Some of it goes to the third world. Some of it becomes landfill. Some of it's reprocessing. I called the phone number. A guy named Andy Sissick answered. He's a veterinarian, nicest guy in the world. He likes to go deep sea fishing. I take him deep sea fishing twice a year, and he lets us go through his junk. I have a larder with about $30 million of stents, catheters, balloons, guide wires, all for free. And it's available to everybody everywhere. And not just medical devices, anything. If you're a little resourceful, it's all out there. So I'm going to just run through this. This is one of the things I did early lessons, the AFib project, the one I was at Home Depot, and I used the tube from Windex. I wanted to come up with a way to tie off the left atrial appendage without opening the chest. Um, I went to my expired junk thing. I got some, a magnet, put it on the end of a Fogarty catheter. So there's a little balloon catheter with a magnet on the end. I made a left atrial appendage, the little bag on the top of the heart, the thing that threatens your life when you're in atrial fibrillation. I made it out of a baggie. I put the little balloon catheter in there, used magnets to attract. I thought I could slide a magnetic catheter outside the heart. That blue tube is the tube that was in the Windex. There's the balloon inflating. 
I tighten the knot and tie it off. With that, I was able to raise the first couple million dollars. That was over $100 million ago. We're now in an FDA trial that's going really, really well. This is what it, it's really cool, too, because, again, I told people about this, and nobody was enthusiastic. Everybody said, well, you're going to put a magnet inside the heart. You're going to slide a magnet outside the heart. People won't do that. It won't work. All the naysayers. So now roll forward four or five years. We're doing live cases at the TCT, this big heart meeting. I'm in the back of the room. This is maybe the fourth or fifth case we've done live. We now have done six, 7,000 cases. And the two magnets go like this, and they click together. And everybody, the 700 docs there go, oh. And I go, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's, and it's so exciting to see this thing have a, and the number of articles that have been written about this. And if we win this amazed trial, it'll be a wonderful, wonderful, uh, a wonderful, wonderful adventure. And I think we will. Anyway, this is a case. I won't go into it. Uh, you know, as you know, this whole field, everything you do, everything we do, it's all about people. It's all about building the team. And to get people to join your team, you got to be passionate. It takes passionate, passion to bring people in. You got to be a cheerleader. If you can't be that person, that's okay. Find someone who can and team up with them. It's all about putting together a team because you got to get people to quit their day job and bet on you. And so you got to know what you're talking about. You got to get the right people and meet the right investors and put together the right syndicate. And it takes passion to do that because it takes a lot of energy. And you got to learn to deal with failure. You will fail. It, that's okay. That's part of the process. You get up, you shake yourself off like the Wright brothers did and in 1908 when Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge died in their first crash. Uh, I also encourage people to keep their eyes open because there are opportunities everywhere. Somebody looked at people carrying suitcases the airport and said, you know, but if we put wheels on those, it would be easier. I mean, obvious, obvious things. The guy who came up with the idea of cutting butter and putting wax paper between them. Come on now. <laughs> this is a great quote about not keeping your eyes open. Men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves off, up and hurry off as if nothing's ever happened. We all do that. Edward Jenner, he didn't notice that the milkmaids had smallpox. He heard them talking about it when he was 11. Everybody knew the milkmaids didn't get smallpox. Everybody knew it was because of, of the cowpox. He just figured it out because everybody else had shrugged about it for 25 years. You know, it was an opportunity just waiting for somebody to pick it up. Alexander Fleming, his actually lab, the mold didn't come in through the window. The windows were nailed shut and painted shut because they knew the mold spores would keep the bacteria from growing. Everybody knew that. He's just the first one who looked at a dish and saw the zone of inhibition and said, oh, it's some liquid that the bacteria makes, or that the mold makes. I bet we can figure out what that liquid is and develop penicillin. We noticed that every once in a while, someone would get shot or stabbed, and if it hit the artery and the vein, the two would become connected, and that those connections stayed open forever. This is a man stabbed in the thigh by his wife with a kitchen knife. Uh, and it went through the vein and hit the artery. And you can see when we inject the artery, the long skinny one to the left, it lights up the vein, the blood goes through the injury, and nowhere else. Well, that's important because we make these connections between arteries and veins to put patients on dialysis. There's no blood vessel big enough that has enough flow in it. So we very carefully dissect out the artery and vein and sew them together. And the vein dilates up over the next two or three months. Many of you have probably seen patients that have had these. That allows the nurse to stick the needles in. But in 2017, about half of those fail. And they require multiple procedures. That's interesting because when somebody gets stabbed like this and they develop a connection, the textbooks say, take them to the operating room and fix them. They'll never close on their own. Wait a second. These ones we make with our beautiful magnified vision, our heart surgery fingers close off half the time. But the one, uh, some guy that didn't even graduate high school does with a pocket knife, stays open forever. So I tried to find this guy who was stabbing all my patients. <laughs> The bottom line is, we thought there was something to leverage and exploit. I got some magnets, I got some catheters, I made these laughably crude magnetic catheters. I put one up the femoral artery of a sheep. The little dot is the electrode, the long uh, elements or magnets. I put one in the vein, I passed electricity between those two little uh, nails. And when I injected contrast, I showed that I'd connected the artery and vein. 
With that, we were able to raise money. In fact, one of our investors is in here. Brian, are you here? There's Brian Smith, uh, Sante, S3, and a number of other uh, folks have chipped in. Uh, this is the device now. Uh, uh, actually, this is our legacy device. This is one we did a big trial in Europe. We're waiting to find out whether we're through the FDA. Uh, some exciting times for us. Um, lots of strong little magnets throughout the catheters. Uh, here we are in South America, in Paraguay, holding our collective breath as we're doing our first in man. That was 300 or so cases ago, 350 cases ago. We've now redesigned this device so it's four French, small enough that you can put it in in the wrist. It's about a 20 minute procedure. Uh, everybody that uses it thinks it's gonna take over the whole field. We'll see, we're really excited about it. There's the little electrode coming out. It's on the vein, the top catheter's in the artery. We actuate it, it just blasted through. We take everything out, we leave nothing in the patient but a hole. Uh, anyway, so that's been very exciting. And again, it started with just doing that little experiment. Uh, um, last thing, I've got 40 more seconds. I'm gonna talk about expanding my, can, can I take like three more minutes? Okay, I, I'll take that as yes. Uh, this, is my, this was my home shop, this is behind my house. But my favorite tool, when I was cutting up spoons, it was this. My real favorite tool is this. How many of you guys, know how to do PowerPoint. Everybody knows how to do PowerPoint. Who taught you? You just messed with it, right? How many of you knew how to do computer-aided design? Okay, more than uh, expected, but still, the rest of you, shame on you. Look, <laughs> this is 2018. Everybody needs to know how to do digital design. It's so easy, it's fun, it allows you to just goof around, make the things you want in your house, in your life, to invent, to try new things. 3D printers are now available at Home Depot, you know? They're available everywhere. Uh, you can take your thing that you designed on your computer and make it something you hold in your hand to test out that hypothesis instead of sitting around thinking about it. And if you get nothing else from this talk, that's what it's all about, is taking action, thinking about it, instead of just thinking about it. And now we can print in metal. This is a new technology. It uses a metal dust that it centers together and that's how we've uh, moved forward with the Bivacor project, which is a three hour talk in and of itself. It's the first practical, completely artificial heart uh, that we're working on at the Texas Heart Institute. That's a cow, has no heartbeat, no pulse, no EKG. His heart has one moving part. It's one of the sort of holy grails of innovation that we've been involved in. So I wanna spend the last minute talking about my new position. A year ago, a little over a year ago, I transitioned to Johnson & Johnson to try to leverage what I just described into my job instead of my hobby. And we're creating a new facility, we've created, it opened last November, called the CDI, Center for Device Innovation at the Texas Medical Center. And the idea is to leverage the incredible resources of Johnson Johnson, the largest healthcare company in the world, 125,000 employees, we touch two million lives a day, something like that. Uh, to leverage those incredible resources with the resources of the Texas Medical Center, the largest medical center in the world, and a bunch of innovative people in a maker space to try to accelerate medical device innovation from concept to proof, fail fast and pivot, or show that it has merit. Uh, why Houston? For any of you that have never been to Houston, it's the largest medical center in the world. 54 member institutions, 106,000 employees. Last year, 182,000 operations. No place like it. Stanford, Harvard, combine them, still not as grand as the Texas Medical Center. Uh, these are institutions in the medical center, Baylor College of Medicine, the Houston Methodist Hospital and their mighty facility, the Rice Engineering Department that have all joined our efforts at CDI and become our partners and signed memorandums of understanding with incredible teaching facilities, incredible opportunities to train physicians on new devices, incredible resources to do cutting edge uh, research to develop the merit of new uh, technology. And this is a very unusual asset. This is an ICU for animals. It's manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's why all the major VADs and artificial hearts have been developed in Houston. And that's part of our new expanded CDI scope. And the biggest thing we have is the people. And to do these big kind of projects, it takes big teams. This is one of these artificial heart animals coming out of the OR. 
Uh, so this is the new maker space. This is the Center for Device Innovation at the Texas Medical Center. It's a 26,000 square foot place uh, facility with lots of room for group and individual work. And there's a VR center there for visualizing concepts. I think she's actually killing zombies, but uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful resource uh, with places for 22 engineers. We've just hired the first six. Uh, and most importantly, a really cutting edge, world-class maker space with every kind of machine here, it shows it here, uh, CNC mills, turning stations, laser cutters, water jet, 3D printers, 3D scanners, every kind of welder, really an amazing resource. And the guys at Johnson Johnson said, I don't care if there's a lot of investors there, you're not allowed to talk about the new technology that we're working on there. But I don't see anybody here from J&J. &J. So um, one of the things that we're doing that I'm really excited. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you very much.